Whatever rots your socks, whatever spins your top Whatever winds your watch, whatever flips your flop Whatever turns you on, whatever flies your flag Whatever bangs your gong or whatever swings your bag Do it often but do it well Cause nobody knows and there's no way to tell When the ride ends Good morning. Welcome back to Turtle Beach. How was your week? Great, great. Mine was fantastic. Every week on Turtle Beach is fantastic. No matter how I struggle to screw it up, they remain fantastic. We're going to go out on the beach. Uh, the sun's coming up over there. We're going to go out on the beach. We're going to sit around and talk for a few minutes. And during the walk, I want to give a shout out uh, to my friend Paul McCarthy back in Iowa. Uh, his daughter Marie uh, wrote to me uh, this morning and said that Paul has entered hospice. And Paul was scoutmaster for the troop my son and I belonged to in Boy Scouts, which was a blessing. I tell you what, for a divorced father, Boy Scouts is pretty awesome. And my son is an Eagle Scout, and I'm very proud of him for achieving that. And I hope he is too, but Paul was instrumental in that. Uh, and uh, I always found Paul McCarthy to be trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And Paul, buddy, wherever you're headed, I'm right behind you. Wow. Feels. Old friends, you know. I live alone, you know, so I get sentimental. But Paul has been a very, very dear friend to me. And I miss him. You know, he's one of the things I miss about my old life. We all... We all crow about this life we've built in Thailand. But for all of us, I think there's something, you know, unless you're on the run from Interpol, there's something or somebody back home uh, that you miss from time to time. You miss them poignantly. And Paul is one of those people for me. So Paul, buddy, I'll see you at the next station. We're both prepared, right? Be prepared. Wow. I came out of nowhere. All right, good morning. <laughs> Welcome back to Turtle Beach. Ah, I was watching this interview, Tyrish Times. I'll tell you what, Pete, Pete should be working for a big network. Hang on a second. Give me a second, all right? I do these things without edits and uh, just have to give makeup and hair a chance to do their job. Uh, yeah, I was watching this interview with a guy who uh, went to the University of Iowa, as did I. A guy who always wanted to be a writer, as did I. A guy who wears the same glasses, as do I. But a guy who apparently got the memo that uh, on Pete's channel, Tyrish Times, you have to wear a ball cap. I didn't know, I didn't wear a ball cap. But the guy has written a, a, a bunch of novels. He's a graduate of the Writer's Workshop, the University of Iowa Writer's Workshop. He's written a bunch of serious literary novels that all have 17 or 18 or 20 reviews on Amazon. And he has just completed a, a, uh, a crime novel set on Phuket. A let's, let's all uh, get excited by imagining dead hookers crime novel. And I thought, Christ, how many do we need, you know? Christopher G. Moore has written that novel 20 times. Tim Hallinan, 10 times, extremely well. Colin Cotterell, nobody beats Colin Cotterell for crimes set in Thailand or, or Southeast Asia. You know, Jake Needham, uh, who else? John Ralston Saul, The Paradise Eater. Uh, uh, God, what a good book. 
Uh, so it's been done, you know, it's been done and done and done and done and done to death. And the guy's a graduate of the workshop. Uh, I'd, I'd love to ask him, why'd you settle for this? Why, why, why? I'd also ask him why in the first chapter, there's a single sentence in the past tense, the, the entire rest of the chapters in present tense. Why all of a sudden for one sentence, you jump to past tense, but that's, that's a conversation for him and his editor. And everybody's a critic. I decided not to make that comment. Now I'm making it here, but I didn't make it in the comment section because I'm hopefully 18 months back in Thailand has evolved me uh, past that snarky guy. But we all have that in us. You know, we're all just ready to jump all over whoever we're talking to uh, and criticize them. Before I forget, before I forget, listen, uh, Boontongs was visited by some people this week. Uh, Jaime and Nat uh, from Spain, very, very generous, sweet people. And uh, Jack and Diane came back and, and brought uh, Tim some gifts, not me, uh, <laughs> this time. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, I want to reiterate, Boontongs, the doors are always open to come and visit, have a cup of coffee. So snarkiness, uh, yeah, we're all ready for that. I, I took one class from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop and uh, uh, they, they taught me I was not welcome in their classes because I was not a member of the workshop. And the other students let me know that I was not welcome by not commenting on my writing, ignoring my writing. I got one comment though, uh, one student wrote a single word on one of my stories. He wrote glib, G-L-I-B, four letters that are a slap in the face, an insult, you're glib. <laughs> you know, other people, 90% of people would just say you're shit. A writer in the workshop says glib, one word. So hopefully I'm not that guy anymore. Uh, somebody said, and you know, the, here, may I, in an aside, And some chai, some chai revs up his engine every time I come out on this beach <laughs> to shoot. No, it's actually, you know, at six o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, they're going out to fish. They're doing their job. Steve, don't throw rocks at them. They're just doing their job. Just speak up and enunciate and your viewers will understand you. Yeah, somebody uh, uh, commented, you know, I, I've been showing some of my uh, arts and crafts projects uh, on this channel. And somebody wrote in and said, twirling her mustache, uh, I love how Americans will call school crafty projects art. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, it is craft. What she's saying is Steve, don't, don't pat yourself on the back. Don't call yourself an artist. You are at best a craftsman. I'll settle for craftsman. You know, I don't know why. That's a conversation. A thousand dissertations have been written on the subject of where's the line between art and craft. Uh, why do we treat a Bernini fountain differently than we treat a shaker chair? Or for that matter, why do we treat either one of those uh, differently than we, we treat somebody who sits on a soapbox, you know, why, where are the lines? When, when does craft become art and, and, and are they not perhaps already parallel? But at any rate, yeah, what I do is arts and crafts, you know, I was a brownie leader for three years <laughs> uh, and uh, they kick the dads out when the girls start going camping. But boy, those young years, I think it's third, fourth and fifth grades. Uh, popsicle sticks, glitter, school glue. Yeah, I was the king of that shit. And I still am. I'm, I'm, I'm having a very fun time using recycled trash off the beach to create just stuff to look at. Uh, so yeah, you know, this idea of throwing brickbats, this, this automatic knee jerk reaction we have when we're in public and certainly when we're considering somebody else's creative uh, output or accomplishments, our knee jerk reaction is to critique and hopefully it's constructive criticism. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with telling somebody, yeah, I think you you, you, you swung and missed on this one. I, I think artists, craftsmen, all of us, we need feedback. And if it's delivered, you know, with an idea of helping this person improve their, their craft or their art, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Let me tell you a little story. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> ah, we all just woke up, didn't we? Oh, here. Uh, you know, we face west, as I have said. Oh, am I going to get up out of my chair for you? Yeah, I guess I am. So uh, we face west. So we see beautiful sunsets. We don't see much in the way of sunrise. My neighbor Tian with the, the uh, broccoli store, he started, let's see if I can point it out. Yeah, so that's, that's my house. Yeah, that's my house. And that's the broccoli store. Uh, and uh, yeah, so T has started putting deck chairs out here at night. Uh, you know, the only time he can really draw a crowd is at sunset. That's that's what we're famous for here. And uh, so he started putting chairs out on the beach. Uh, but he is negle he's neglecting to collect them at the end of the night. So in the mornings, they're just there's old beer bottles and, and, and cigarette butts and stuff sitting out here. And people think I'm uh, promoting Turtle Beach to the point that it will be overrun with tourists. And I'm complaining about a single pair of deck chairs <laughs> on the beach. Anyway, so yeah, let me tell you a story about a criticism of art based in Thailand. Uh, so my mom, <clears throat> when I was little, I was born in Los Angeles and lived there until I was about 10. My mom had a friend named Lee Snow. Lee and Betty were <clears throat> beatnik, beatnik chicks together. They wore black turtlenecks and black berets and smoked French cigarettes and coffee houses and applauded for poets like this. And uh, Lee and Betty uh, uh, would hang out. They both had a son, uh, an only child, a son. And, and Lee's son, Dana Snow, was about five or six years old older than me, but we'd go over to their house and mom and Lee would sit around and yak and mom would say, you go play with Dana. Well, I would be about nine and Dana about what, 14? And there wasn't much to play, but Dana uh, was trying to be a comic book artist as a tween. And he had a, a room full of comic books and he had a drawing table and some real expensive pens. And he was drawing a comic book called Tank You. This was during the Vietnam War, and, and, and he was drawing a military comic about a tank with sentience named Tank You. And uh, I thought that was fascinating, the idea that you could, that art was something created by a person was new to me at eight or nine. I thought they just, you know, books and movies just existed in the world. I hadn't realized there were people behind all this. And that, to me, that was pulling back the curtain on a lifetime of creativity, I hope, and debt. <laughs> yeah, be an artist. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, so uh, so we knew them. We left uh, LA, I was about nine or 10, I guess, and, and uh, didn't see them again, but my mother had an oil painting of a watermelon signed Snow by Lee Snow, her dear friend Lee Snow. That thing hung on the wall of every house we ever lived in. We moved a lot, and that painting went with us everywhere we went. So 18 months ago, I'm getting ready to, to retire and move to Thailand. And uh, mom has gone from her home in New Mexico to a managed care kind of place, a, a safe place, a building full of other people and nurses and doctors and, 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 and things to do, a rec center and stuff. And, and at any rate, she had been there two years and seemed to like it. And I said, mom, I'm leaving. And what are we gonna do with all your stuff? And so she resigned herself to a massive garage sale and an auction and giving away gifts to everybody she knew and stuff. And in this process, I said, uh, what about Lee's painting? What do you want to do with this watermelon? She said, uh, oh, I, I, I've looked at it every day of my life. I don't need to look at it anymore. Uh, what is Dana around? Can you find Dana? And, and, and maybe Dana wants his mom's painting. So I went online. I looked up Dana Snow. It turns out Dana has spent his whole life trying to be a stand-up comedian in LA. He's gone from open mic to open mic, open mic, improv class. He had an agent and uh, he was very well known in the LA uh, stand-up community. He had helped a lot of uh, stand-ups become successful. He himself had never gone beyond the, the open mic stage, except one time in 1997, 
uh, Billy Crystal was hosting the Oscars and he had a contest. He said, there's this new thing called the internet. Have you heard of it? And the Oscars in 97 were the first Oscars to have a dedicated website. And he said, I don't know what this is really, but apparently anybody with a computer can, can contribute to this. So if you've got a joke, uh, pitch us a joke and we'll pick three and I'll tell your three jokes on the Academy Awards. And he picked one of Dana's jokes and uh, told this joke to an audience of, it says online, a billion people. So one time Dana Snow had an audience for his joke of a billion people. So I reached out to him. I got him. I got his email through his agent and uh, reached out to him and said, do you want uh, Lee's painting? And he wrote back very graciously and said, <clears throat> no, I got a million of my mom's paintings. Thank you, but uh, go ahead and give it to Goodwill. Which I did. And uh, that was that. So I come to Thailand and a few months before, or a few weeks before I came to Thailand, I launched this channel. And I've been doing this every week that I've been in Thailand. And when it began, it was a variety show format. An old uh, Carol Burnett episode, three minutes of monologue, three minutes of uh, humorous sketch, three minutes of video essay, yada, 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 fake ads, yada, yada, yada. And in the, the, the process of doing that, I used to tell jokes, which I've kind of gone back to uh, recently. I'd close every show with a joke. And I was using old Catskill jokes, Jewish humor, because in this day and age, I figure that's safe. I've got the, the street cred to tell those jokes. And uh, I thought, you know, I know a comedy writer. I know uh, uh, Dana Snow. And uh, I wonder if he'd like to write me a joke for my channel. So I reach out to the dude still got his email, I reach out to him. I said, Dana, uh, I'm doing this video, this vlog from uh, Thailand. Would you write me jokes? Are you interested? And he wrote back a one sentence. Why would I want to write for some sleazy vlog from Thailand? <laughs> You're watching sleaze. Dana says so, this is sleaze. He'd never seen it. He, he would have loved it if he'd seen it. He never saw it. Uh, he just assumed an old man making a vlog in Thailand is going to be sleazy. And I think I probably sometimes I cross the line into sleaze, I suppose. I don't know. If that's what you're looking for, stay tuned. It'll come along. But at any rate, you know, that knee-jerk reaction to, to simply criticize. The irony is, there's two codas to this story. The irony is, I've you know, my videos at the moment are getting about five or 6,000 views which isn't much by YouTube standards, but uh, other than that one night at the Oscars in 1997, I'm sure Dana Snow never had an audience of more than 50 people. His jokes would have received literally a hundred times more audience on my channel than he ever got going to open mics in LA, ever. That's one bit of irony. The second bit is, and God preserve us from this, all of us, like I said, he helped a lot of young comics in LA, giving them advice. He went to everything. He saw everything and he took notes. He was famous. Guy died in his seventies. He was around LA for a long, long time doing this, sitting in the back of the room, taking notes and comics would notice somebody writing down their jokes and confront them. And no, 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 he was writing down technique. He was writing down thoughts on presentation and he was helping young uh, standups. And so he became pretty famous and notable. There's Dana in the back. Don't worry, he's not writing down your jokes. Don't worry about Dana, he's harmless. So he was very well known in the community, in the industry in LA. And uh, there is out there a transgender comic who's doing, uh, put a video clip uh, on her YouTube channel, an homage to Dana Snow. She's in, in a club at an open mic. She's standing in front of the audience and she says, I heard that Dana Snow passed, and I'm very sorry to hear that. I love Dana. I love Dana since the first time I met him when he told me that he enjoyed having sex with trans women. I think, I, 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 at least I think it was Dana. I hope I've got the right guy. <laughs> well, Dana's dead. He can't clarify for us, but you just outed the guy and, 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 and then said you're not sure if he's really the guy. And then you put that on YouTube, that that clip will get more views than any audience Dana ever had himself. You know, I mean, how, 
what what is the thinking behind that bitch <laughs> please nobody do that to me when i'm dead and gone don't come out and say you know ah steve uh, admitted to me that he liked killing kittens and making them into soup yeah what did you, i think it was steve ross i don't know maybe it was christopher g moore i don't know <laughs> maybe it was this other guy on tyrus times with the glasses just like steve's and the ball cap i, I don't know anyway that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, and share. There's more. There, there'll be little things after this. I'm not, I'm not letting you go just yet. But that's it for the monologue. Thanks very much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is the most important time of my week. I love you guys. I really do. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Like my new tooth? Since 4.30 this morning, I have been trying to unknot this rope. I have a ton of blue rope that I found, you know, on the beach. And I want to use it on two sides of my turtle there to, to represent the ocean. I want to coil it up to represent ocean swells. And then this back here, white rope, uh, which I don't think I will coil, just leave it haphazard like that, to represent the sand, the beach, and of course these are eggs behind what uh, we assume is a female turtle. But, oh my God, I'll tell you what, I've been doing this since 4.30 and that's as far as I've gotten. That's it. This rope is very old, very stiff. It's not hemp rope, it's uh, plastic. So it's very, very stiff, but there's a lot of good blue rope there. And I like uh, the way these coils look and uh, I'm gonna keep working on it. These are the, this is the easy stuff over here. Everything in shades of blue. And that stuff's not too hard, but oh my Lord. Oh my Lord, this giant squid is making my joints hurt. Thanks for letting me vent. Here's today's shells for what it's worth. Oh, and I'm gonna make a giant mosaic. This is uh, the pattern I'm gonna use and I'm gonna use uh, bottle caps. Uh, yeah, bottle caps to be the pixels various colors of bottle caps, various types of bottle caps. And uh, blue is the most common color of bottle caps. So uh, that's gonna be that. It's gonna be, I reckon, about five feet square, maybe six feet square, big. I got a, bottle, a lot of bottle caps and there's more on the beach. So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's the projects this morning. And this is, uh, these are the Yindi twins, Yindi Tonrap, to stand outside, Yindi Tonrap, and what I'm finding is the Yindi Tonrap twins, I don't know if I still have it up as a screensaver, but the Yindi Tonrap twins, come on, are supposed to be cute. That's why everybody uh, uh, puts them outside their, their store. They're supposed to be cute. Well, it's very difficult <laughs> to make cute out of trash. Interesting, you can make perhaps. Uh, fascinating even, but cute, it's pretty tough. These are gonna be his, uh, his hands. Of course, they have to Y. So these are the boy's hands. And uh, these, his arms will be this stuff here and he will be encrusted in little boy toys and then the girl will be encrusted in, uh, you know, little girl toys. And they'll be the Yindi twins. These are easels, they stand outside the door. And uh, I got the wall painted and this has turned into a very, very long post. Never mind. I've been ending these by showing you. Yeah, I forgot to put my tooth in. <laughs> I can see how this is going to end real soon. I'm just going to space it and you're just going to get used to seeing Steve Ross missing a tooth. 
Anyway, this is the Market Street here in town, uh, probably one of the oldest, uh, busiest uh, streets in town. The houses here are very old. Uh, and twice a week, there's a big, huge, fresh market up there, and this entire street down to the corner will be filled with vendors vending all kinds of stuff. But I've been showing you some of the turtle iconography and telling you a joke to end these. So this is a recent mural, and I think it's done very well. I'm gonna try to see if I can aim the camera. I'm mean, gonna, you're gonna have to bear with me. Contai, Southern people, Pemjai, have full hearts. And that is, uh, what does that say? Uh, Chai Lei, Thai Mueng, Thai Mueng Beach. Chai Lei is the, is the beach. Uh, Chai, the edge, and Lei, the sea. Ta Lei, but down here they say Lei. Uh, every cooperation needs you. Mm, okay, I'll go along with that. So a joke, listen, I want to tell you Dana's joke that he uh, got told on the Oscars. Most successful thing the man ever did. He spent his life, literally his whole life, since I knew him when he was like, what, 13, 12, 13 years old. Spent his whole life trying to be funny, writing jokes. And this joke was the most successful joke he ever had. It was told at the Academy Awards by Billy Crystal in 1997. And the joke was, I figured out how to guarantee I'm gonna get an Oscar next year. I'm making a movie called Price is Very Sexy and Waterhouse is a Genius. Pause for laugh. In that crowd, you know, the joke relies heavily on you knowing who Price Waterhouse is. Those are the accountants who count the votes and announce the little envelopes they open up. Those envelopes come from Price Waterhouse and nobody except Price Waterhouse knows who won before that envelope's open. So the crowd there that night in the auditorium would get that joke. Maybe some of the billion people who watched it on TV would get that joke. You probably didn't, did you? Because it's not a great joke. But it was Dana Snow's biggest success of his life. And you know what? I just gave him his second biggest audience of his entire life. I just read that joke to more people than had ever heard a Dana Snow joke in history. So Dana, good luck with better audiences wherever you're going. And uh, Paul McCarthy, uh, I love you, bro. And uh, I wish you uh, pain-free days. Same thing I wish myself. And buddy, I'm right behind you. Wherever you're going, I'll be there next. I'll see you there. Bye, you guys. Have a great week. Whatever shades your sheep, whatever bakes your glam. Whatever digs your feet, whatever smokes your hand Whatever blows your nose, whatever chews your bone Whatever squirts your hose, whatever sings your song Do it after but do it well Nobody knows and there's no way to tell When you ride and This shit you be doing now, you be ever put it out, do it in that day Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it up, shoot down